I want to thank you and welcome you to this week's edition of the Mayor's Brief. With me, I have a good guest, a good friend. His name is Mark Froman. Welcome to the show, Mark. Sandy, thank you very much for inviting me. Glad to be here. Well, you know, it's always good to have a University of Michigan man here, and I want to thank you and, and welcome you to our community and, and appreciate all the value you've brought to it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your consulting small businesses uh, and the process and what does that look like, and because I think it's important in this post-COVID-19 world that we're finding ourselves in. We're, we're established businesses at some level or even having to kind of recreate themselves or, or go through a startup of sorts. And so I'm really concerned about how do we jumpstart our community? Sandy, I'd like to uh, go back since there are a lot of questions. Sure, here. sure. I'm, you pick I'm the, one, pick you the like. one I want. <laughs> there you go. Fair enough. But, uh, be, be, before uh, COVID, uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, and it was accelerating uh, up until COVID, and then it got dramatically uh, greater, was the need for businesses to look carefully at themselves, and more so to look outward at the trends, the, the changes, whether they're governmental, marketplace, technology, and uh, determine what changes, if any, they needed to make in, in their business and their operations or their business model. And a number of companies did that fairly well and uh, were successful, uh, grew. A number of companies did not either do that at all or very well, and they would went either generally flatline, uh, did not have positive cash flow, some went down. What COVID has done is taken what companies should have been doing, and many of them have been, uh, for the period previous to February of this year, and accelerated by a magnitude of 10 in terms of uh, small companies, and, and big companies, by the way, nonprofits, mm -hmm. cities as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think any institution is exempt from this. but uh, And we don't know where it's gonna come out, but I think based on my experience in terms of watching trends before, the companies are gonna to have to increase their ability by at least a factor of 10 to adapt, to be mindful of the new environment and adapt. So your question at the end was, what would I tell a small business owner? Uh, it'd be, it's the same thing. I, I still do a little consulting uh, that I would tell some of my big corporate clients. And that's, there, there, there's four things you gotta do. And it's, uh, it's C-A-A-C. Okay. The first thing you gotta do is uh, conserve cash. Cash is gonna be king through all of this. In fact, with the banks tightening up liquidity requirements and uh, being more conservative in terms of their risk portfolio, uh, loans are gonna be a little harder to get. So companies, uh, conserve cash, and um, if you've got uh, loans, they, they look good on your balance sheet. So cash management is number one. Number two is uh, stay, pay attention, the, the, the A, attention to the environment, what's going on. Uh, as I said earlier, things are gonna happen a lot quicker. Some of the changes are gonna be more dramatic than we're used to. And the sky is not falling, the world is not gonna go upside down. Some things you'll need to preserve, but you've gotta be attuned to things that are happening in the environment relative to your customers, relative to your competition, uh, uh, relative to the market overall, technology, that, uh, that so you know what to adapt to. You can't just conserve money and make changes. You've gotta figure out in between what's going on that you can change to. So the third thing I say is adapt. Figure out what changes uh, you can make to add value to your customer or to increase demand, whether that's more social media, whether it's uh, selling online, whether it's products to be used at home, pruning products, pruning your product, adding products, uh, figure out how to adapt to the, to the new environment. So that now we've got the C, the A, the second A, and the fourth one is the, the second C, and that's a connect. Uh, everybody says that, and every, I think 
I agree with them in terms of social media, uh, with your customers, also with your employees. Uh, connect with your vendors as well. So stay current with them uh, to see what changes they can tell you about. Sandy, there's another group that I think is, uh, should not be overlooked, and that's connecting with, believe it or not, I'm serious, connecting with your competition. I see what's gonna happen now with the uh, changes. Uh, different, um, in different industries, companies are gonna all be feeling pain uniformly. And if they uh, reach out to each other and determine how they can help each other, uh, in some ways that's win-win for both. Absolutely, I get it. The world's changing and you've just gotta be ever cognizant of that, looking for any and every opportunity. Because my competitor in this case may not be my competitor. It may be my customer. If I've got right. additional capacity, well, maybe I change my business model. I'm no longer trying to serve the end user, but rather, rather maybe I can just be a cog in the manufacturing wheel. B to B instead of B to C. That's Absolutely exactly right. right. So maybe that fits, maybe that works. Maybe my competitor has got a better sales organization than I do. Yeah. Lots of reasons as to why Great that example, be. Sandy. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that I am most curious and, and want to talk a little bit about is cash. I mean, right now, the SBA is, is throwing money out there. I had a teleconference, uh, town hall meeting with the president of the Gold Leaf Foundation yesterday. And, you know, he had approved a number of money. He's going to use uh, local banks as intermediaries to qualify bridge loans. So right now, there are a lot of people that are thinking, okay, cash, and how do I get it out there to businesses to keep them going? But I don't think that really speaks to the liquidity crisis that I've and I believe that we're going to end up with Correct. in really a few short months. Yes. I mean, we've given away as a government approximately 100% of our GDP for one year so far in this crisis. Uh, so you don't well, have. Well, maybe more because GDP is shrinking. <laughs> well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, last year's GDP. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. I mean, we haven't given away more than our GDP. Well, those are big numbers, you know, on a percentage basis, you know, for a country or anybody to have to undertake. So, you know, conserve cash is part of it, but, you know, how do you really deploy it? And, and how are you seeing your recovery coming back? Are you seeing it kind of going to come back into place? Do you think it's going to be more of a slow ramp up? Do you see, um, you know, what's, what's the consumer's behavior going to be going forward or would you anticipate? I know nobody's got a crystal ball, but it is important, I think, for folks to hear. Well, Sandy, in your question, I think you put... In, in, uh, you, you, you put the key uh, of the answer in, in the question, and that it's, it, it's consumers' behavior. Sure. And so if, if we take a look at, uh, based on history, uh, what's happened in the past, and I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, wish, wish, wish I did, but in any event, uh, if we just look at uh, what's happened uh, in, in, in past economic or other sorts of uh, crises, uh, you know, there, there's been a general uh, immediate reaction to say, uh, "This is horrible. It's, uh, you know, how can we survive? Uh, we've never had to go through this before, and somehow we've managed to go through it." But at the once we start coming out of it, consumers are more mindful, thoughtful and cost conscious. Right. And I think that's going to uh, occur here. Uh, hope to God we get out of this I and mean, we really do have an up, uh, uh, come out of it in a way that's first and foremost uh, in a manner that's safe uh, of, of our people uh, right. from a health standpoint. But from an economic standpoint, I think the people will be much more economical, uh, cost conscious in what they do. So, I, uh, and plus the restrictions in terms of uh, ongoing social distancing will limit the capacity of some particularly hospitality-based uh, uh, entities to generate a lot of revenue. I think we're gonna come out slowly. So on the one hand- the short answer. 
So on the one hand, we have a lot of people that are busting out of the seams, ready to get out and do something. But in a, an environment where I don't really have a whole lot of liquidity, a whole lot of money, or like cash, not so much I can do. And those who might, if the environment in which I can participate is now limited, either by closure or by uh, social distancing uh, rules that have been put in by the government, uh, the capacity is just not there for those, uh, for those institutions. So uh, I, I get it. So that does make it for a very slow, slow process. And even in our own state, where the governor, you know, I so appreciate the approach that he took relative to other states. He defined the conditions in which he believes that phase one should go to, or phase two, or phase three, versus saying it's a date certain issue. And so I really appreciate that because now you can kind of follow along. Uh, hopefully it provides a little incentive for folks to continue to distance themselves. It'll be interesting to see what our neighboring states in South Carolina and Georgia uh, have done and what impact that has in terms of spreading COVID in their worlds. Um, but, but anyway, in, in, in looking at what he's done, the recovery, and if there are relapse, could also have issue as we're, as we're looking forward, as we go forward. Yeah, so, and I think, by the way, Sam, if I can just tack sure, on that, going back to the other question, I think that's part of why uh, the public will be uh, more uh, m mindful, my word, going forward, uh, because there's also this, at least now in, in, in uh, the media, this uh, uh, concern about a uh, second wave. Right. So I think, number one, we're going to be more conservative in our behavior. Number two, we're going to hang on to our cash in case there is right. a Absolutely. second wave. Plus, uh, the banks are going to be tighter with their loans, too. So that's a number three. Well, look, I'd like to switch topics a little bit with you and talk about something that I know that you love and I love, and that's really the local economy. And what should we do here in Rocky Mount to really kind of spark, we'll call it an entrepreneurial renaissance? Uh, you know, how do we bring jobs into the area? I believe, as I think you do, that mostly job creation of small businesses, uh, entrepreneurs, not to say that we wouldn't take the you know, BMW manufacturer who will hire 2,000 people and love that. But you know, how, how do you, what do you see are our strengths and our weaknesses here in our community? Well, our, our, our strengths are certainly uh, our uh, entrepreneurial uh, platform that we have now mm -hmm. and our, our history of uh, spawning small businesses that has grown. We also, I think another strength is our, uh, is the, the leadership that we have in the city, uh, both at, in, in, the, at the, in terms of city administration and in, in the business and nonprofit community. I think for a city our size, 55,000 people, you take a look at, uh, uh, at the, the people we have in city administration at the top, and also some of the leaders of businesses uh, and uh, other organizations, we're blessed with leadership that can help uh, develop uh, that uh, our, our local economy and, sure. and support the efforts. Uh, so I think those are uh, two of our strengths. I, on the other hand, uh, let me just say from a a weakness standpoint, we don't have the collaboration going on. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, we don't have uh, an agreement on a common goal, uh, at, you know, which we have to start with uh, in order to have a dialogue about what should the priorities be to develop that type of uh, uh, city that's very supportive sure. uh, of, 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 of small business. And we've also got an issue about inequality that I think is, is real and uh, needs to be uh, addressed as, as part of that uh, in, 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 in entire effort. So I guess really the bigger challenge that you see is, is how do we build collaboration within our own community? Uh, and uh, go a little bit deeper on that. Is that a, a public versus private, not-for-profit? Uh, where's the disconnect in your estimation? Let me preface what I'm going to say by, you know, I, I've been fortunate to have taken a look at other places, other cities, other organizations, 
that have done the type of thing you and I are talking about right now and I identified a couple of right. common denominators. You know, if you're going to be successful, you know, the, the places that have been successful, the entities that have been successful, they've all done uh, three things. Now, okay. The, the, now, the three things all represent one, so I'm going to just start with the one, and that's a, a, any effort at uh, building uh, the, 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 the business environment and, and, the, and, and the number of jobs always gets down to increasing access to information and advice for entrepreneurs, small business owners, increasing access to services for them, and increasing access to capital. Uh, the efforts that have done all three have been successful. If you do just one, say, give them money, give them money, you know, get investors uh, on board, that's important. Uh, but it, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's gonna take uh, an effort that uh, does all three. So what does that involve? Uh, it does involve a, a public-private partnership. It does involve making sure that what you do fits the community, that, it's, it, 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 that one size does not fit all, or, or the, the regional plan, and make sure that you have buy-in. And buy-in includes have, getting input from all levels. So the, 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 the disconnect here is we haven't done that. Right. You know, it's not about, you know, uh, I'm a bad guy, you're a good guy, or, or uh, it's that we haven't sat down at the table, figured out what our common goals are, and come up with a plan uh, together to, to move ahead. Uh, you know, there's other issues in terms of uh, disparity of, uh, of service and uh, availability of resources here in the city uh, that are somewhat, uh, maybe some are structural, some are systemic, uh, that we, we need to address as part of us becoming the type of city that we all want the city to become. I think uh, that you know, at least stands out in my mind, but it has to be part of the greater process of having that, that goal, developing that uh, partnership, and then um, moving ahead to provide the access to the information, services, and the capital. Sure. Well, you know, I had an opportunity yesterday, or it was this week at least, to talk to some people about um, it was really economic de development oriented, but more more like residential development. You know, how do I put in some large developments in the area, right? Because we've got jobs coming to the area. So the question was really, do I select Rocky Mount or do I select a, a cornfield out in Nash County or in Edgecombe County and build my own little gated world? Um, you know, really, how should I fit in? What would be the best? use of dollars, and this was just sort of an exploratory conversation. You know, we don't have anybody ready to sign any papers or, you know, you know, make a closing yet. And so in that conversation, I was really asked two points, which I think really, really speak to the heart of what you were saying. One is let's talk about um, crime and let's talk about your education system. And so what we all know is that it's hard to have a world-class economic development process without a world-class educational system. And we all know that in our area, we've struggled with the scores of, of, our, of our school system. Um, and I believe it's just that. When you have a third of your children who are living in poverty, you're food insecure, they're couch surfing, when you have a community with a $38,000 Median household income has actually dropped. It's 37.5 now. Uh, median household income. You're dealing with economic levels that people are really not secure where they are. So if I'm growing up in that household um, and I don't have a stable household, which is defined as just the basic resources and at least a parent who cares, loves for me, and, and provides for me those things that I need to grow emotionally and otherwise, it's really hard. Now, the school system is not designed to fix that. It's not the school system's job. They're there to educate children. But we as a community, I think, need to go and support 
um, you know, those kids to try to create at least the equity of opportunity. And so, you know, what I think really does change that is how do we create an economic development? So it does become a chicken and an egg. And then it also, and that all starts with a plan. That's been one of the frustrations I've had is not a clear cut plan that we're all willing to embrace to achieve an economic development. Now, when it was all said and done, I think our individuals left very happy and very committed to at least exploring Rocky Mountain going forward, uh, understood the educational arguments that really our school systems are not failing. We as a community need to reach out to those in our community that need to help to kind of create that. We have, we have a lot of kids that are just falling between the cracks. So we got to start there. So the bigger challenge, as I see it, is less about those items, if we get people to agree on them. And, and I think that there's a large group that, that, that do believe that, that are supportive of it. But how do you get everybody together, try to figure out what that plan should be? Yeah, economic, uh, Sandy, I, I, I agree with you. you. Economic development, I mean, that covers a multitude sure. of potential initiatives. And economic development, to one person uh, may be defined as something very different by somebody else, particularly if they have a different uh, culture or uh, educational background. So right. I think what we, uh, and, yeah, to, okay, and let me, you know, kind of take a long jump off a short pier here. Not, economic development to me is uh, uh, not only business development, uh, but also community development, uh, housing, uh, education, and I think, the, and, uh, and marketing, and leadership. Okay, so I've just come up with six things that I, I would uh, be happy to uh, argue need to be considered if you're really looking at a robust definition of economic development. I'm not saying they're right, but I am saying, as, as you said, we need people to come together at the table to, to discuss them, set priorities, come up with, okay, we need some early wins. We need uh, you know, to, to, to show that, uh, to get people more trusting and confident in what we as a city can do, but it's gotta be in the context of a longer term plan. Right, which does raise all those boats, all the all six that I mentioned. Actually, right. no. Well, the other thing that I had mentioned too is in my my story was crime. So, Mark, when you go back and you look at the statistics, I mean, we sh we show up as the twenty third safest city in North Carolina. Yet, in every poll I did during my campaign, and even subsequent to um, seeing data, roughly half of us feel like we're not in a safe place. Well, that's an emotion, that's not necessarily a reality, but we've got to address that and deal with that as a community because that's controlling the narrative way too much. And if we've got challenges we've got to identify, we've got to be willing to be transparent with ourselves and just figure out where resources are, but that's part of a plan. And so it's about getting people to the table. And, uh, and I, I'm, Sandy, I may, I may, I may uh, maybe a little off, uh, off, offbeat view of this, but, now, certainly our, our, our storytelling has to be better. Right. But I think the way we change that is by changing some of the processes of, the, of that, that you and I are talking about. Mm -hmm. Great. And let the message get out about not that crime isn't bad, but let the message get out. Look at the positive things that Rocky Mountain is doing. That's correct. That's uh, correct. In, in all those six areas. And, let, and that in and of itself, I think, will be a much stronger force to create the positive narrative than somebody saying, hey, I'm, I know a PR person. Right. Exactly. Well, no, no, that's right. I'm not trying to put powder on the pig, so to speak. It is about bringing uh, healing and discussion for an entire community. We are a singular city. We are, we are one Rocky Mountain, and that does matter. So I think our time's kind of running out here, but is there one other thing that you would like, any other thing you'd like to leave us with um, before you go uh, related to economic development and development of our community as a whole that you, particularly having been a, a leader in our community, but uh, originating from a different place with a different perspective, might be able to provide insight that maybe the rest of us don't see? 
Sandy, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the initiative and in trying to bring people uh, not only to uh, share their views, but also to come together to tr you know, in terms of trying to help uh, start that culture of, of uh, cooperation and collaboration that we need. The, so having said, thank you to you and your staff. The other thing I would say is Having had the opportunity uh, to travel an awful lot, not only in the United States, but also outside the United States, and had, uh, been blessed to meet with lots of uh, leaders and, uh, and lots of organizations, I, I, would, I would say Rocky Mount has, uh, compared to a number of other places I've been, has a lot going forward. Mm -hmm. And rather than pointing out our problems to each other, if we could uh, you know, uh, appreciate what we've got that's working. You know, thank you for saying that because absolutely, in the story that I told about meeting with this group uh, yesterday, it's not if somebody's coming to the area, it's when and where. Do we get to be part of it as a community or is it just gonna be just on the outside and we're outside looking in? So look, I want to thank you so much for coming and joining us today and appreciate all that you do and ask that you keep on keeping on. Sandy, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mayor Sandy Robertson. And I'm Ron Green, President and CEO of Boys and Girls Club. And we're here to ask you to help us during this difficult time in the city of Rocky Mount during the COVID-19. Boys and Girls Club is sponsoring many different programs that help our children as well as feed them. We're asking you to please contribute your time, your money, and your efforts. Please visit us on the website below. Yes, remember, serve all young people, but especially those who need us the most. For the month of June, the city's business will be the development of the budget for 2021. Now, this budget review work session schedule will look as follows. On Thursday, May 28th at 4 p.m., there will be a presentation of the city manager who will propose the 2021 budget. And then the council will develop a work session associated with that presentation. Monday, June 1st at 4 p.m., the council will continue their work session on the budget. Tuesday, June 2nd at 4 p.m., again, the council will engage in a work session. Thursday, June 4th at 4 p.m., the council will have a work session. Monday, June 8th at 7 p.m., Budget public hearing will be held during the regular city council meeting. On Wednesday, June 10th at 4 p.m., the council work session will engage if necessary. And then on Monday, June 22nd at 4 p.m., the budget will be adopted during the regular council meeting. It's important to note that all these dates are open to the public, but you will be asked to stay in the atrium where there will be social distancing practiced. The lobby and the address for City Hall are 331 South Franklin Street, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. We thank you for your participation and look forward to seeing you there.